Hello, friends. On behalf of the staff, we miss you. We're grateful for the technology that allows us to bring this service of morning prayer to you. Please stay tuned to our weekly email that will keep you up to date on the various ways that we can stay connected throughout this pandemic. We'll be offering reflections during the week, opportunities for group conversation, and links to other resources. I've been reflecting on two ideas over the past couple of weeks. First, that this pandemic makes it so clear that we need each other, that fundamental to God's creation is community. We need to listen and learn from one another, and we need to care for one another, even when that means staying home. And second, while we are so grateful for the first responders who are on the forefront of this pandemic, perhaps we have an opportunity here, as our movements are restricted, to slow down a bit, to live life at a slower pace, one that makes room for daily prayer and reflection, and for nurturing relationships, even if through the wonders of technology. Our prayers are with all who are suffering from this virus and all whose livelihood is impacted from the changes in our economy. May we hold tight to the hope that sustains and nurtures us. Christ lives with us. Now, let us pray. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have, have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and, and our, our mouths mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, Come let, let us adore him. Let us say together the benighted. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let, Let us, us shout, shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. The psalm appointed for today is a portion of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abimadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Here ends the reading. Let us say together the third song of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or night, they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation, and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, 
Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple." But we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet, he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. 
Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. Here ends the reading. Good morning. My dog, Carew, is a gentle soul. When I first got her from the rescue, she curled into the tiniest ball with her nose under her tail and just stayed on the couch for weeks. <laughs> Within the first few months, though, she and I developed a routine. I would come home from work, Carew would be on the couch, and I would kneel down in front of her to say hello. But one day, Carew changed the routine. I came home, I knelt down in front of her, and she untucked her nose from her tail and looked me in the eye and very softly, for lack of a better word, snuffled me <laughs> on my forehead along my hairline. It was the first time she had voluntarily touched me and it felt like an anointing. She seemed to be telling me, right now, in this spot, on this day, I belong to you and you belong to me and we are in this together. Like a parent's kiss on the forehead of a child, like the hug of your best friend, like waving and shouting hello to your neighbors that you don't typically visit with, but now you can't, so it seems much more important. <laughs> <laughs> you are mine, I am yours, and we are in this together. These are the earthly anointings that we give each other every day. However, I often wonder what Samuel and David feel when one anoints the other in the scriptures today. David is dirty and smelly and has just been working in the fields when he's called away from his job to meet the most famous prophet in the land. Samuel has been obedient to God, but he still has questions in his heart about why he's there. So when Samuel anoints him, does David know? everything's about to change? Does Samuel even say anything when he anoints David? The scripture doesn't tell us. It might be a silent anointing. After this narrative, life seems to go back to normal for Samuel, but changes drastically for David. In the next chapter, he has to leave everything he's known. He has to change the scope of his world and his place in it in order to live into his anointing even though he doesn't know what any of this means or why it's happening. Any of this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. The man from the gospel today also has to reorient himself, as do the disciples. The Pharisees are challenged to reorient themselves, but simply can't. You see, congenital disabilities like blindness were seen as judgments from God during this period in history. So when the disciples ask who sinned, this man who's blind or his parents, they must feel like they're about to get one of the world's great mysteries solved. But Jesus refuses to choose, neither this man nor his parents, because illness and disabilities aren't related to sin and judgment. Instead, Jesus tells them that the man was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. 
The Pharisees are so discontent. The healing didn't happen in quite the right way. It happened on the Sabbath instead of a work day, and healing is work. It happened to the wrong person, someone they assume was born into sin, not someone righteous. This healing didn't fit into their moral universe, and yet, there it was. They petition the man again and again to explain himself, and he tries his best and then finally says, one thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. And the Pharisees are left to wrestle with the implications of that. Beloved, this is tricky theological territory. <laughs> it's important that we don't assume that all illnesses and disabilities come from God, whether as judgments or opportunities for healing, because from there it is a very easy segue into saying that COVID-19 is God's judgment on us, and that is not the God we know. Jesus chose this man in this particular moment to give him a gift, healing, and to let everyone around wrestle with the implications of what that meant. We are all wrestling with the implications of the virus that's sweeping our world and how it fits into our own moral universe and how we have to reorient our lives and hearts because of it. But what is the gift of this moment? It feels wrong to contemplate that there might even be one, and yet, like the healed man, David gets one too. Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Most of us in this congregation have been anointed with oil or seen someone anointed with oil before. In baptism, after the clergy pour water over people's heads at the font, you might not be always able to see it very well, but the priest makes the sign of the cross with oil on the person's forehead. But this anointing isn't silent like Samuel's may have been. As she makes the sign of the cross, the priest says to the person, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. This is a special moment in time when we remind people that right now, in this particular moment, you belong to God, and God belongs to you. And not only does God love us infinitely, God gifts us with the Holy Spirit, just like God gifted David with the Holy Spirit, and through it, Jesus gifted the man with healing. The Holy Spirit, which is the active force in our lives, counseling us, comforting us, prompting us to action, and leading us into deeper communion with God. Friends, if there is a gift in this particular moment, in this particular place, I think it's one we've already received. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives in each of us, which is the same Holy Spirit that lands on Jesus like a dove when God opens the heavens and says, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The same Holy Spirit that is sent to us in the upper room when the disciples are hiding in isolation and fear from the rest of the world. It is the Holy Spirit that calls us into community even when we are apart. And once the Holy Spirit is sent to us at Pentecost in that upper room, it is no longer just for special occasions when the heavens open. The Holy Spirit is for each of us, every day, for all time. It is the presence of God in which we live and move and have our being. And we, we are the anointed ones, called by God to service in this moment, called to God's witness in this moment, called to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. One of our saints, Teresa of Avila, wrote a famous prayer with those words. She says, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. In this particular moment, we are clearly called to minister to one another in whatever ways are possible for us. 
and I strongly encourage everyone to participate in that work daily with earthly anointings. But I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that Teresa of Avila, the mystic who wrote this beautiful outward-focused poem, also wrote a book on how to become closer to God called The Interior Castle. It's about cultivating our souls. Friends, as life continues to change shape considerably for each of us over the next few weeks, when our physical worlds shrink and our virtual ones expand, and just like David and the disciples, we have to continually reorient ourselves in order to live into our anointing. I want to remind us that tending to our interior castles is also the work that we are called to do through the Holy Spirit. We are the disciples, scared and isolated in the upper room after Jesus' death and waiting for something to change. But we will miss out if in the chaos and shifting expectations and urgent need to care for others, we neglected ourselves, our souls, our own interior castles. In the midst of all the mess around us, with just a little intentionality and a little space to breathe, we can let our fear and grief and anxiety give birth to a space for us to meet with God we are also called to this moment and this work. We are called to wrestle with our moral universe right now and to the quiet internal processing that helps us not only endure these weeks, but realign our hearts because of them. It might be in the snuffle of a dog, in a quiet moment with a candle, the smell of spring and the deep breath that you take in the backyard, in a good book, or in the longing for the front hug of a friend from whom you're quarantined. Let's sit in these moments. Let's ponder and discuss them, not organize ourselves out of time to have them. We must engage with these moments knowing that we're not necessarily going to solve or fix anything. That's not the point. The conflicts in our moral universe, frankly, are unsolvable. But our relationship with God exists and deepens in conversation with her, even when what we're asking is, what the heck is going on here? The good news is that we are not alone. The Holy Spirit is in this internal work with us, and we get to choose whether we walk out of quarantine miffed like the Pharisees, amazed and a little confused like the disciples, or professing the Christ, despite all our uncertainties, like the healed man. Church, we were made for times such as these. I don't think we expected to be, and we certainly didn't want to be. And yet here we are, wrestling with the implications of our drastically changed lives. We were anointed for this. We were gifted with the Holy Spirit in order to get through this. And we will get through this together because we all belong to each other. And as we look forward to being physically reunited around the altar once again, to Easter and to resurrection, I just keep trying to remember in the midst of this darkness and uncertainty, there is an Alleluia coming at the end of all of this. Amen. Continue with the Apostles' Creed, saying together, I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, our Lord. Lord. He, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray in the words which our Savior taught us. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And, and we shall never hope in vain. Gracious God, the creator of us all, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with the litany amidst the COVID-19 outbreak. God the Father, have mercy on us. God the Son, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Most merciful God, we come to you in this time of anxiety and uncertainty surrounding the outbreak of COVID-19. As the sorrows of our heart and mind increase, we beseech you to save us from all trouble and fear. Cast away all works of darkness. Be our rock, a castle to keep us safe. For the Lord is our stronghold and sure defense and he will be our Savior. For all who have died, receive them into the arms of your mercy. Grant them eternal peace, and surround those who mourn with your healing grace. Lord, hear our prayer. For those directly infected with the virus, help them recover in good health, and restore them in body, mind, and spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. For those at high risk of infection, especially the elderly, underlying illnesses, the marginalized, and the poor, keep them healthy and free from all sickness. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in quarantine, the shut-in, and the infirmed, help them find peace, keep them in good health, and renew their mind and spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. For all hospital, doctors, nurses, and staff. Protect them as they minister to the sick. Relieve all stress and provide the resources and space to meet the needs of all the infirmed. Lord, hear our prayer. For first responders, guard them from all harm and grant them strength and courage as they respond to all calls for help. Lord, hear our prayer. For service industry workers, and those forced to work as their community shuts down. Keep them healthy. Bestow the resources to best care for themselves and their families, and assure them in times of financial and medical anxiety. Lord, hear our prayer. For those experiencing financial loss and uncertainty of resources, have mercy on them. Alleviate any fear and provide for them daily bread and wage. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of this nation and the world, 
help them make sound and safe decisions to the best secure the future of our planet. Lord, hear our prayer. For all scientists and those working to find a cure, inspire them toward your truth and help them discover and disseminate a vaccine and cure. Lord, hear our prayer. For all media and journalists, Protect them from all harm in their reporting and move them to be a vector of truth and certainty and never fear or panic. Lord, hear our prayer. For all places of worship, embolden them to be beacons of hope and love and help us together and to gather however and wherever we can, be it in person or online, to give you praise. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our church, help them minister to their flock, fortify them to be faithful pastors, to persevere in prayer, and to build up the family of God in new and creative ways. Lord, hear our prayer. For the young, spare them from harm and fear, and keep them a joyful sign of your love and light. Lord, hear our prayer. For all parents, build in them strength and fortitude for the time ahead and give them the words and witness to be wise counselors and compassionate caregivers. Lord, hear our prayer. For calm amidst the storm, as the waves toss our boat and we wonder, do you not care? Remind us to not be afraid, that with you all things are possible, and that even the wind and the sea obey you. Lord, hear our prayer. Stir up in us a spirit of compassion and tenacity for the time ahead. Amen. Move us to check in with loved ones at high risk of infection and those in quarantine. Amen. Ease our fear and anxiety that we may share our resources rather than hoard them and extend a helping hand to those in need. Amen. Inspire us to share the good news of your hope and love. Amen. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, healer of the sick, ruler of the tempestuous sea, and savior of the world. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Let us pray together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that, that with truly thankful hearts we may, may show forth your praise, not, not only with our lips, but in our, in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.